Good morning, everybody. Exciting to be here with you on a very, very special day as we uh, remember Mother's Day. And we want to say, first of all, uh, Happy Mother's Day. Uh, we're looking forward to what uh, God has in store for us today. And I'd like to begin just as we're going to talk about Blueprint for Moms in a moment. I want to make sure you understand that this message is for everybody. OK, so don't tune out just because you're not a mom, but we, uh, I thought it may be interesting. Uh, in fact, maybe you can identify some of these things I'm going to share with you. These are things our mothers taught us. And if um, these kind of hit home, you just kind of raise your hand there, you know, so we know it applies to you. You might not want to be too close to your mom if you're doing that though. All right, here we go. Uh, my mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. Uh, she said this, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside. I just finished cleaning. My mother taught me about religion. She said, you better pray that will come out of the carpet. My mother taught me about time travel. If you don't straighten up, I'm going to knock you into the middle of next week. My mother taught me logic. Because I said so, that's why. My mother taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. My mother taught me irony. Keep crying and I'm going to give you something to cry about. My mother taught me about the weather. This room looks as if a tornado went through it. My mother taught me the circle of life. I brought you into this world and I can take you out. My mother taught me behavior modification. Stop acting like your father. My mother taught me about anticipation. Just wait until we get home. My mother taught me about receiving. You're going to get it when we get home. My mother taught me about the medical science. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, the wind will change and you will stay that way. My mother taught me how to become an adult. If you don't eat your vegetables, you'll never grow up. Mother taught me about genetics. You act just like your father. My mother taught me about my roots. Shut that door behind you. Do you think you were born in a barn? My mother taught me about justice. One day you'll have kids and I hope they turn out just like you. Well, seriously, I want to say thank you to all the ladies today for all that you do. You do so much more than so many times we even realize you are awesome let me say that it's my privilege to honor every single one of you today but let me say this however not all the ladies are excited about mother's day especially as we celebrate it in church some feel a great hurt because they've never been able to have children and there's just kind of a reminder of that when we celebrate the idea of mothers others may have lost a child or are experiencing a strained relationship with a child and Mother's Day is a really tough time for them. And both men and women today may be in great mourning still over the loss of their mother. The list goes on. There are a lot of different things that can bother us, but I'm here today to remind you of God's grace and the fact of His sustaining presence in your life. I've asked my super awesome wife Barbara, to share something with you that I believe will add some perspective to the message this morning. Hi everyone, happy Mother's Day. Uh, you know, Mother's Day truly is a joyous occasion for me. Um, I have, we have four beautiful children who grew up and they got married and then uh, they gave us four um, spouses and now I have eight wonderful children and those eight wonderful children gave us 13 grandchildren, so what I love with every ounce of my being. Um, so Mother's Day truly is a joyous occasion for me. Um, but you know something, I couldn't always say that. Um, there was a time when Michael and I got married and um, I was told I would never have children. Um, I had had uh, probably two or three surgeries and um, my hopes of ever having children were pretty much gone. So we were married for seven years and, um, and during that seven years, you know, I did my 
my thing on Mother's Day of going to church and um, you know uh, putting a smile on my face and and uh, pretending that it was just a wonderful day uh, but it really wasn't for me because all I ever really wanted to be was a mom and um, I had this burning in my my heart to to be a mom um, and to, and it just didn't seem like it was ever going to happen matter of fact I'd gone back to the doctor uh, when we were and Dr. Foley and he said to me um, the best thing that could ever happen to you is if you could get pregnant and then uh, your, it would stop your disease but um, that's never going to happen because you've already had the surgeries and, and we need to just do a final surgery on you and um, I, I didn't want that final surgery and and he was a sweet 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 man and he looked at me and he said well when you go he, he wasn't being mean he was just being matter of fact he said when you go home and when you can't stand the pain any longer um, you will want the surgery so it was about a 20 minute 20 25 minute ride back home and I'm thinking all the way home how am I going to break this news to my husband um, that our hopes and our dreams um, are are never going to happen. We're never going to be able to have children. And um, but before I get to that part of it, I just want to tell you during that seven years, though, I had begun to allow the fact that I could not have children defined who I was as a person. And I believed that I wasn't good enough. Um, I really fought that. I, I fought that, you know, if I was a, um, God knows I'm going to be a horrible mom, and that's the reason he's not going to allow me to be a mom. And uh, so, you know, if I was going to be a bad mom, then I must be just a bad person. And I l truly, really let those things um, eat at me and uh, destroy me on the inside. And um, I remember getting into, um, I, I talk a lot to, I talk to a lot to the Lord in my prayer chamber, and I remember um, saying to him, um, Lord, but you just don't understand. You do not understand. You're not, you're not a mom. You don't understand the, you're not a woman. You don't understand this, this um, yearning that I had in my heart. Um, and as I'm having this little battle, this one-sided battle with him, um, he brought the scripture, uh, Matthew, to me in, in verse 37. I'm just going to read that to you. And it says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I want to gather your children together as hens gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And the Lord brought that verse to me. And I just started bawling because I said, Lord, you do understand, don't you? You do understand that emotion, that, that desire, that burning, because you wanted to bring Jerusalem and you wanted to gather her up uh, like a mother hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And um, so I started getting to that place where um, I realized that God did understand, but I had not given up on the fact that he just doesn't think I'm going to be a good mom. And I let that eat at me because when you start thinking things like that, when you start believing things like that uh, from the devil, then it, it, change, it, it, it takes a whole effect on your life. So I, uh, Michael and I had talked many times about possibly adopting or you know having children in our home in some way. And I just never could um, give in to that because I really believed that, that I was not a good person and I didn't deserve to have children. And so um, when I, as the years went on, um, I, and this came to this place that I was on the way home to tell my husband that we were never going to have children. And, um, I remember when I got into the room to tell him, and it was about a 20, 25 minute ride home, 
And I went in and sat down and I told him and he said, honey, I believe we are going to have children. So I thought, well, you know what? <laughs> He's having more trouble accepting this than I am. And um, I'm not going to tell that part of the story today, but I'm going to tell you within the month, um, I called my doctor back up and um, I, they verified that I was pregnant with twins. And uh, so that's our Seth and Sean. They are uh, in both in ministry. And then uh, 18 months later, we had a little girl and her and her husband serve in ministry. And then three years later, we had another little girl. And so, the, and her and her husband serve in ministry. And you know, so I know though that there are people out there that maybe they're listening to me right now and you have done what I did and you are, have let your situation define who you are. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's not in the same situation exactly. Maybe it's not the fact that you couldn't have children or you don't have children of your own. Maybe it's that you have a broken relationship um, with your daughter. Or maybe you're a daughter who has a broken relationship with your mom. And so you don't, you're not um, thrilled about Mother's Day. Um, maybe you made a decision, an irreversible decision, and you have regrets over that, and you allow that situation to find you, but it doesn't. It doesn't define who you are. Um, <clears throat> you know, since then, Michael and I have had many, <clears throat> excuse me, many um, kids that's lived in our home, We've been, uh, we've had lots of uh, exchange students that uh, were unsaved and that we got to minister to and living with us. Uh, we've had um, uh, single uh, moms-to-be that has lived with us. And so beyond just the four children that we raised, we have been able to raise many, many more children than that. And I have got to open up my wings and gather them underneath my wings and, and love them and protect them and to uh, mentor to them. And there is someone that you out there that needs you um, to open your wings to and uh, become their mentor. And I know that um, you, some you're struggling, you say, well, you just don't understand. You know, I don't understand exactly what you're going through but the Lord does and he has a plan for you and he has a promise for you and he just wants to use you for his glory and for his honor and you just have to not let your past or your present define you but let God define who he has he wants you to be define who you are by him and I'm excited about Pastor's message right now, and I hope that you will not tune out thinking, you know, well, it's Mother's Day and it's just one of those messages and it's not for me. There is something in this message today for everybody, even you guys. So let's join Pastor now as he gives us our message for today. Thanks, Barbara, for speaking from the heart. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your precious word. I thank you that you can heal any hurt that we would ever experience. I thank you, Lord, for loving us. I thank you for mothers. I thank you for that, uh, for a godly mother and for the influence she's had in my life. I thank you for each of the ladies that are listening to this message today. And sometimes we kind of forget uh, to appreciate and to show appreciation for all the sacrifice that they make Lord, today we want to remember that, and I pray that you'd give them a blessed day. But Lord, I pray that you'd open our hearts to what you have for us from your word, and I pray you'd be honored and glorified in the things that we say today. And I ask this in Jesus' precious name, amen. If you've been to church on Mother's Day sometime before, you've probably heard about the Proverbs 31 woman. 
some of you are probably saying, oh, no, no, please, please don't go to Proverbs 31. And I'm just referring to that. I promise you I'm not preaching that passage. But the reason I'm saying that is tremendous passage of Scripture, tremendous description of godliness. But this, this Proverbs 31 woman, no one really knows when she sleeps. I mean, she's always working and she's doing things for her family almost all the time. She's up early. She stays up late. She's talented. She's smart. She runs her own successful business. At the same time, she's taking excellent care of her husband and her children. She's extremely busy taking care of her family and running business, but that still has all this time to volunteer to help the needy, and she always knows the right things to say. Sounds just like you, right? Boy, she sets the bar very, very high. And it may seem to be an impossible standard, but let me say this. Being the person that God wants us to be is always within our reach if we depend upon God to make us who and what He wants us to be. So today we're looking at this. What does a godly woman look like? And can we find a blueprint for being a godly woman and mother? And I believe we can. We've been in Ephesians chapter 5. I want to back up a little bit in that chapter. In chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians, verses 15 to 20, and listen to these words of the scripture. It says, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, and making music to the Lord in your hearts, and give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe what's described in this passage can give us some very simple but really profound ways for all of us to be the people that God's called us to be. But since we're speaking to ladies specifically today, we're going to talk about how to be a godly woman. How to live out that admonition and Ephesians. How do we do that? Well, first of all, to do that is to live a life of faith. A godly woman will be a woman of faith. Now, let me refer you to two mothers that are often remembered on Mother's Day. This reference is found in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 5. These two ladies have their names preserved in the Holy Word of God because of the influence they had as a grandmother and a mother. This is the writing Paul gives us, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. He says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you. So he's talking to Timothy, and he says, I, I know that there's this faith in you, but I, I, know, I, I know where it came from, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded is in you also. Timothy is one of the best-known leaders of the Christians in the first century. There's two books with his name on it. Uh, he is known for uh, being very young and uh, as far as uh, physical age and, and having this tremendous responsibility, greatly used of God. He was a man who uh, was mentored by the Apostle Paul himself, and God used him in some awesome ways. But evidently, Timothy's grandmother and mother became believers during Paul's first missionary journey. And he first had gone into their area. They heard him bring the gospel. They were evidently devout Jewish ladies. And yet they, they were in anticipation of a coming Messiah. And they were convinced uh, from the word that Paul brought that indeed Jesus was the Messiah. And so they believed in him and became followers of Christ. When Paul returns the second time in his second missionary journey, they evidently had already uh, won young Timothy to Christ. And so grandma and mom had, had spent the time talking to their son and, uh, and grandson. And by the time Paul returns, he's already known as a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. Just a young man at this point. He goes on to work with Paul. He becomes his right-hand man. And he dedicates the rest of his life serving God. So the great things, many people in the kingdom of God because of the, of the ministry of a young man named Timothy. And the Holy Spirit today points out to the great influence on his life, grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. As far as we know, as we look at the scripture, Timothy's father never became a believer. There's no indication that he was. 
So here is a mother who's married to a man who has no, evidently, no time for the things of God. And yet through the influence, the godly influence, she raises a young man who becomes one of the great uh, giants of the faith, so to speak. But it was the genuine faith that Paul is pointing out. So we're talking about a godly woman is a woman of faith. This genuine faith of Lois and Eunice is what greatly influenced Timothy. Paul uses that actual word, the genuine, meaning something that's unhypocritical. It's without pretense. There's no deceit. There's no fakery going on here. Lois and Eunice were real. Their walk matched their talk. And many times we look at this and we go, wow, that's, that, you know, that's beyond my capability. And we're talking today about how we can be exactly what God wants us to be. But the point is, I'm sure that they were not perfect. I'm sure they made mistakes in their lives. I'm sure there were times perhaps they spoke things they, they should not have spoken. But they were living a faith, a genuine faith in their life. And they dealt with it in the way they should have. When they had heard the claims of Jesus as being the Messiah, they believed and it changed their lives. Everything was different from there on. A young Timothy saw that, and he embraced the gospel because he first saw that and he first heard the gospel through the life of his grandmother and his mother. Because they were Jewish, to embrace Christianity meant that they most likely would become ostracized and to become a follower of Christ uh, and made it very hard on both of them, but their faith was strong and that's going to influence young Timothy to follow Christ. They were women of faith. Let's think of another characteristic that can uh, be a description of living a godly life. And I think it's this, that a godly woman will be a woman of character. In the midst of the pressures of life, how can any of us be the people we need to be? Character is doing what we ought to do when in many cases it's hard to do and maybe there's no one around really to, to see what we're doing. Uh, it can be either way, but the point is it is doing the right thing, and that's not easy to do sometimes. Now remember, Ephesians chapter 5 gives us a command to be filled with the Spirit. It doesn't tell us to receive the Spirit of God. The Scripture never commands that. Did you realize that? It commands us to be filled because the Holy Spirit is already indwelling the believer. And to be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit of God. When we put our faith in Christ, God gives us the Holy Spirit living within us. So the wonderful truth is this, that every believer has the ability to be the person that God has designed him to be because of the indwelling Holy Spirit. It's possible to have that character. It's possible have that consistency in our lives because of the Holy Spirit living within us. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it's explained to us this way. This is what the scripture says. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. When you look at that description, we call that the fruit of the Spirit. What that basically means is this is the result of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we might look and say, well, I, it's not showing up very much in my life right now because we're not at that point allowing the Holy Spirit to control us. But when the Holy Spirit has control of our lives, this will be the result. Ladies, you can be a woman of character as you allow the Holy Spirit to work through your life. Gentlemen, you can be men of character as you allow the Holy Spirit to work through your life. It is the Holy Spirit that brings forth that true joy, peace, long-suffering, idea of patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, all characteristics of, of the, the, um, having character in our lives as believers. We do not bear this kind of fruit through our own human effort. You may look at that list and say, you know what, I need a little bit more of love and, and long-suffering in there, a little more patience. And so I'm going I'm to get a good, a good book on how to do that, and I'm going to figure it out. And perhaps there's a good book that might give you some pointers, but I tell you, the best book is the Word of God, which reminds us that that characteristic is a result of the Holy Spirit working through us. And so that is what this is all about. This is a God thing. It's not a result of human effort. 
An apple tree does not bear apples because it sits out there in the orchard and, and somehow musters up enough courage to bear apples. It bears apples because it's an apple tree. And we will bear the fruit of the Spirit of God because of who we are. And that fact is we are the children of God, if you've put your faith and trust in Him. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. It's the result of a Spirit-filled life. The moment, remember, the moment we receive Christ, we're indwelt by the Spirit of God. And therefore, we have the potential to produce the fruit, to be people of character. To be Spirit-filled is to be controlled or led by the Spirit of God. In other words, we're walking in the Spirit. Therefore, throughout our daily life, we're to be yielded to the Spirit of God. You want to be a woman of character? Ladies, be yielded and surrendered and submitted to the Spirit of God. You want to be a person? You want to be a man of character? Be yielded to the Spirit of God. One more thing I want you to notice, and I believe that a godly woman will be a woman of conviction. The scripture we read a moment ago in Ephesians 5 makes this statement. It said, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. We are people of conviction when we believe what we believe truly determines what we do. I'm afraid there's a lot of times we claim to believe something and it doesn't really mess with the things we're doing. That is not conviction. True conviction is really living out what you say that you believe. James says it this way in James chapter 1 verse number 22. He said, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. That is a description of how uh, we will know what to do. How do we know what the will of God is for our lives in any given point? And that is to be obedient to the Word of God uh, to the best of our ability, continually in the Word of God. Practice what you preach. You need to know what God says in His Word, but then live it out. There's no good to say, well, yes, I, I know all these things in the Bible and not live them in our lives. Live out what you claim is within. Know what you believe and then live by that standard. A life of faith and character and conviction is not only the best way to live. It's really the only way to live and it is completely attainable through the power of God working within us. And so you don't have to leave this message today in a while. We have the standard here, can't follow it, it's impossible. Well, there is a sense that it's impossible for us to live up to these standards in our own, in our own ability. But for the child of God, it is entirely attainable. It's entirely possible. God never calls us to do something that he does not empower us to do. Now, someone may be watching the message today because your mom talked you into it. And I, I welcome you. I'm glad you're here and I'm glad you're listening. Maybe you haven't really been living a life of faith. In fact, you may have completely rejected the faith of your mother. Uh, today, I beg you to reconsider the claims of a Savior who loved you and died to give you eternal life. I'm reminded of a story I've heard many, many years ago. A young man was raised in a Christian home. His mom loved God and and she did her best to tell him about the Lord. And as, we, as he grew up, he made the decision to leave the things that he had been brought up with. And his mom continued to pray for him. He went the opposite direction, went out into the world and lived a very ungodly life. Separated from, from home for many years, but he finally came to the end of himself and realized his life was a mess and, and realized he had missed out on what really life was all about. He knew he had a godly mom who was praying for him, but he wasn't sure that he would ever be accepted again or forgiven by his, his mom for the things he had done. And so he really wanted to go home and make things right, but he wanted to kind of check it out to make sure that he'd be okay with mom that he showed up. So he wrote her a letter and he said, listen, mom, he says, I'm sorry for the way I've lived. Uh, I've sinned against you, I've sinned against God, and I want to come home but I don't know if you want me. And so I'm gonna be on the train and that old train, it passes right on the edge of her property and there's an old oak tree on the edge there. Hope it's still standing. And I'm asking if, if you'd forgive me for what I've done and how I've treated you. 
I'm asking that you just take out an old white rag and hang it on one of the branches of that oak tree. And when I go by in the train, I'll be looking, and if I see, if I see that 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 white rag hanging in the tree, I'll know that I've been forgiven and I'll come on home and if there's nothing there and you have every right to reject me, I know my life has been a mess. He got on the train and began the journey home after, of course, he'd given a letter time to reach his mom. That day, as the train was nearing the old homestead, he had his seat right next to the window so he could see the fields. And he's looking for that old oak tree and just straining his eyes to see it. And finally they came over the crest in the hill and looked down. There wasn't a little white rag hanging on the tree. What his mom had done is she went into her house and she took out every bit of laundry that she had that was white. She had her bed sheets and she had the pillowcases and she had all the tablecloths and she probably even borrowed them from the neighbors. She had that entire oak tree covered with a white cloth saying, you're not only forgiven, you're totally forgiven. And I think of that story, you know what? That's exactly what Christ has done for us. Sometimes we have turned our back on him, we've sinned, and we're saying, God, could you ever forgive me for that? And he says, I have forgiven you. That's why I died on the cross for you. Don't reject that amazing, amazing forgiveness that God offers to you. Some of you have a mom and a dad that are praying for you to come home. I urge you today to come home. Would you do that? Would you bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. And I'm praying right now there may be someone who has never put their faith and trust in you. Maybe they uh, even are your child and yet they've turned their back on you for some time and they need to come home. Lord, I pray that if these words are reaching that one, that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would draw them to look at what you've done for them. That they can see that the forgiveness is offered and you're inviting them to come home. Lord, help them come home. I pray for every believer may be struggling with areas in their life. I pray for those who are discouraged. I pray for those who are going through hurt and pain. Being reminded of, of some of the hard times in life, maybe even today in a special way, give them comfort, Lord, and strength that only you can give. Thank you for your blessed presence. We praise you for this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And uh, one of them is... We uh, have set up, once again, at the church, a photo booth. This is a special day. You want to get those pictures of, of mom on, on Mother's Day. And so uh, if you uh, can make the trip into Berlin here and just come by the church, um, we have a photo booth all set up. It's a, I'll let Barbara kind of explain to you how that works. Um, we just go in the uh, door, the back door by the pastor's office there. We have, we have it set up in the fellowship hall. So you go right in there and take some pictures and have a great time doing that. And it's easy. I, I can even do it myself. So that means it's super, super easy. Can you explain to them how it works a little bit? Yes. Um, so when you go in, the, the photo booth set up, it's actually an iPad with a light ring on it. And on the screen, all you have to do is to start, is touch that screen, it will get it started, and then um, you take your pictures. Don't, you know, don't make them all really s serious pictures, but have some fun with it, like you that, yeah. Have some fun with it, and then um, at the end, when you're ready, uh, you can uh, accept it, and on the end, next screen will be, um, you can have them either emailed to you, or you can have them text message to you, and then we, you receive them, you get to print them out. Of course, we always like to honor all of our ladies in a very special way, and, and we have something uh, to give to you, but we can't exactly give it to you today. Can you explain what I'm trying to say? Okay. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> okay, so we have um, always planned that on Mother's Day uh, this year, Pastor and I were gonna give the ladies of the church a gift of a paint party and um, you don't know, have to know how to paint. Uh, it's just a time of fun. I will uh, give you step-by-step instructions right through it. And at the end, you have created a great uh, piece. Um, so 
because of the quarantine we can't do that yet but as soon as the quarantine is up we are planning a paint party at the fellowship hall for mother's day and it's our gift to you okay you don't want to miss that it's going to be a lot of fun uh, i want to remind you that we do have a bible study now on wednesday nights uh, meet us at wednesday on wednesday night at seven o'clock and um, i enjoy going through the scripture in a verse by verse format we're in first john this week we're beginning in chapter two so i hope that you uh, just set aside some time for that and um, just join us as we study God's Word together. Okay, communication is really important, especially right now, but always, okay? Uh, I just want you to know that Pastor keeps his phone right by his bed side, and if you even need him at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can give him a call. He says some really weird things when he first wakes up. Okay, you have to just understand that. You just have to understand <laughs> Let that. Let him wake up. <laughs> Let him get woke up. And, uh, but he's always here for you, and that's what we want you to know, that if you need him, you need me, we're always here for you by uh, phone and by text. But we also have a couple of other things that when we want to get information out to you and or another team member wants to get information out to you, it is called Flock Note. Flock Note, okay? And simple, if you'd like to be a part of that text messaging system, you just simply put in text to um, FBC Berlin, and you text that to 84576. Again, the number is 84576, and you put in the text message FBC Berlin. That opts you into that uh, ability to receive texts from us. The other thing that I have personally has become very um, vital in my life is called Echo Prayer. Um, it is a step above, it's new technology for us to have that prayer chain that we are so used to doing where everybody calls somebody else and but you know sometimes that doesn't the chain gets broken because uh, someone wasn't at home and so they don't get to call the next person that they were supposed to take care of and so this is just an easy way um, that puts all your prayer requests right into your phone on this app called echo prayer which you will need to download that from your either your play store or your um, if you have an iphone your app store and when, if you'd like to be a part of that, you can um, just send me a, a message. Let me know that yes, I need you because I need your uh, your email address to add you to that group. There is a group that goes out that it goes out to everyone, to First Baptist Church, the whole congregation. There's also a group that Pastor has just for the men, and there's a group that I have just for the ladies, so that we can have uh, prayers. The other nice thing about this is all the prayers are right on your phone and every day I can go through and you can also add your own personal uh, requests that maybe you don't want to share with any anyone uh, but you can put your request on here you can flip through the phone and do your prayers at the end um, then even you can even notify people if you choose to that day that you prayed for them whoever put in a request it is a wonderful way to have all the requests right convenient to you. You know, you might be sitting in an office, if we ever get to go to an office again, you might be able to sit in there and you can go through that and you can pray. You can use it in your daily devotions. You can use it all the time. And we want you to opt into that if you possibly can. One of the very important parts of worship, of course, is uh, not just hearing the Word of God, not just participating in singing, but also in giving of our tithes and our offerings. And that's still possible to do. And and I know many of you have already called and uh, you're sending in the tithes and offerings. Uh, but if you have not yet got the church address, we encourage you to do that. Uh, you can send tithes and offerings into First Baptist Church, Post Office Box 313, Berlin, New York, 12022. And we'll make sure that all those funds are uh, taken care of and um, just you can experience God's blessings in so many ways. So uh, one more thing, we make sure we don't forget that. And okay. that is on the three. three. One, two, three. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day. Have an awesome day. And by the way, guys and kids, be really nice to mom today, okay? Take good care of her. All right, you guys have a blessed week.